Hello and welcome to episode 17 of Absolute History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic, Islamic history and a global medieval past. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Talha Asan, a PhD student at the School of Oriental African Studies in London. Now on to the show. In 10th century Baghdad, at the peak of Abbasid power, daughter of a female Sufi, Zaytuna, a domestic worker, along with her agnostic brother, Teen, a detective for the grave crimes section, both self-murders amongst the Hadith scholars, Hanbalites and whores in the capital of the Caliphate. This is the premise for the novels of our guest this month, Dr. Laurie Silvers. Dr. Silvers is a retired academic specialising in the history of Sufism. Welcome, Dr. Silvers. Thank you for having me. You currently have two parts out from your quartet, The Lover and The Jealous. Crime fiction in the Caliphate, to the best of my knowledge, is unprecedented. Before we look at your intriguing protagonist, Zaytuna, you have been a lecturer for many years. When did this turn as a novelist occur and why? You know, for me, it actually started when I lost my job. Uh, I'd always wanted to write fiction. Uh, my sister actually just sent me a story she found among my mother's things uh, that I had written when I was 12. It's a lovely little horror story. I posted it on my Instagram feed, actually, if anybody wants to take a look. But weirdly, my style of writing hasn't changed all that much. I was really surprised to see that. Um, and I even had a really good sense of plot back then. So I'm, I'm super proud of that little girl and, and, and what she did and the dreams she had. And, uh, and I'm finally fulfilling them now at, at 55. But back to the present. Once I was no longer teaching, uh, and people who teach will understand what I'm about to say, once I was no longer teaching, I finally had the time and headspace to do something for myself. And so I started writing fiction again uh, at the urging of my partner and my mother. I wasn't sure, though, if I could do it. So I wrote a horror novella about an incel to see if I could get comfortably inside the head of a despicable character and if I could tell a story at all. Um, and as it turns out, I could. Uh, so from there, I thought about what I really wanted to write. Um, and so the Sufi mysteries are an extension of my academic work sort of brought into a fictional world. But also they're about my love for murder mysteries. It's something that my mother and I shared. Uh, we would read the same mysteries together and talk about them and, and how, the, how the plots figured and how the crime went and the hiding of clues and all of that. And so she urged me to put my Sufis into a story detecting crimes. So here we are. The protagonist of your crime fiction series, Zaytuna, a domestic worker, is a figure one rarely encounters in the Tabakat biographical diction genre. Tell us about her and where did you find inspiration for the details of her character? Zaytuna is inspired by a question I asked myself when I was studying the accounts of early pious and mystic women. I wondered what it would be like to be the child of a woman who loved God more than anything in this world, including her children. A person who, as some accounts tell us, would even resent the distraction of children from her worship. There are actually a number of accounts of women with their children. Some were doting mothers, spurring their families on to feats of worship, whereas others were not so happy to find themselves pregnant and actually spoke to God directly about their feelings. They were not shy. Uh, we have accounts of men who felt the same way. But their social responsibilities lay elsewhere. Having children brought the burden of earning money, but not the direct interference in their worship that it would be for women. They could work in ways that supported their need to be in a state of remembrance at all times, such as being a traveling fabric salesman uh, who would walk from city to city. And this would allow them to be away from their families, have time to themselves, and even visit the mystics in each city along the way. Even merchants were relatively free in their shops for worship and conversation with other mystic friends in between customers. So while men were busy, uh, we know that they did not have the distraction of having children present. We all know that children present a certain kind of mental intrusion uh, on you what that, uh, that your work does not. So it was different for women. So the work I did on early pious and Sufi women, uh, written up in the Cambridge Companion to Sufism, 
looks at how the social responsibilities of women from all classes shaped their worship. And as an extension of that, I wanted to look at these women's lives uh, and the men in their lives and tell their stories as I had imagined them beyond the bounds of academic writing. So while I didn't find Zaytuna as a particular person in Tabakat work, although she is named after the housekeeper for Junaid and Nuri, who is in the novels imagined as Mustafa's mother, but she carries the traces of all the women I've studied. So let's think about it for a second. We typically only hear about these women after they've already arrived at peace with God. This is what the Tabakat stories have. Maybe they have that, but not much else. So I wanted to think about what their lives were like before. What was their path like? What stresses did they experience? Were they ever in love? Did their love for another get in the way of undertaking this path? Did they have friends? How did their friends handle their change in devotion to God? In a way, these novels are Zaytuna's most ridiculously detailed and strange Tabakat entry. The, the first book, The Lover, represents her spiritual crisis, which is sort of, I guess, equal to a conversion story. Uh, the second, The Jealous, is when she undertakes the Sufi path in earnest and must begin working the level of the soul that takes itself to task. The third, uh, which I'm writing now, The Unseen, is at the level of inspiration coming to understand the nature of mystic experiences and navigating them correctly. Uh, the fourth and the final one, the peace, will be when she arrives at peace with God. But, you know, I also want to point out here, since we're sort of talking about sort of spiritual path stuff, that Amar, my Shia police detective, is parallel to Zaytuna's character. So every stage that Zaytuna goes through, Amar goes through as well on his own Shia way. And I wanted to give a sense of the breadth of mystic experience in early Islam. It is not uh, specific to Sufism itself and not specific to what we would think of as Sunni Islam uh, in the past. And uh, and I wanted to, to do that through his character, as well as through all the other characters in the book who are all sort of, you know, in even even teen in his own agnostic way is on a spirit is on a spiritual path because he's on an arc of, of humane development. The historic Sufi Junaid makes a cameo in your novel, as does the humbly scholar Al-Barbahari, anachronistically. Whilst Mustafa, a humbleite Hadith collector and Zaytuna's chaste uh, love interest, appears to be a composite of different figures, let's have a closer look at some of your other characters. I love that you brought up Mustafa. So, so let's talk about him. He's a he's an interesting character, and as we're sort of looking at him, we'll get a sense not only of, of uh, of who he is and his person, but the kind of work that a character does in a the character has to do in a novel. All the different sort of jobs that a character has to do, and and Mustafa's doing particularly a lot of work for me, uh, historically, fictively, and ethically. So historically, I wanted a character who could embody the spirit that we find in the accounts of Ahmed ibn Hanbal's respect and love for some early pious and mystic folk. Uh, there was a real sweetness there. And I wanted a character that exemplified that bridge between these two worlds, which right now we tend to see as, as distinct from one another. And so I wanted to show uh, how, they were, how they were interwoven at that time. But I also wanted to show that Sufis had scholarly training and at times positions. Junaid himself was a legal scholar, and this will be the norm in later centuries. But I wanted to make the specific point for the early period where I think it seems less obvious for people. Also, Mustafa is a lay Sufi. So let's think about that, right? He doesn't undertake dedicated practices with Junaid or any of the other aunts and uncles in the Sufi community. He grew up in the community. He continues to take guidance from them, but he's not a specialist on the path the way Zaytuna will be. So here, he's helping me show the breadth of involvement in Sufi community as well, where you have people on the very edges who are sort of lay members, uh, all the way to people who will become Sufi teachers themselves. So now our poor Mustafa is even doing more work for me. He allows me entree into the world of Hadith. So I asked myself narratively, how do I get into those spaces? Well, if Mustafa were a Hadith scholar, then he could open that door for me. I also wanted to show a real diversity of attitudes and approaches within the Hanbali community. 
And Mustafa is on one end with some of his colleagues and certainly the humble Hadith scholar who comes to give that public lecture uh, on the Hadith of Golden Chain, who is, by the way, named after Sulaimi. And the figure of al-Bahari himself, who who uh, who is an ex who sort of takes the role of, of the of the Hanbali extremist on the other end. Now, closer to Barbahari, but not exactly, are those scholars who are doing the work, uh, who are doing scholarly work as a career path with aspirations to administrative power and wealth rather than piety. And so I wanted to sort of give this 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 broad view of of that world, and and Mustafa really allows me to do that to enter that world and show that. Now Mustafa also, as Zaytuna's love interest, represents a world she cannot enter. So this also helps us understand Zaytuna's position in the world better as well. Within the Sufi community, the two are at ease having grown up with each other and they love each other for who they are. He deeply admires her sense of justice and her outspokenness. But as we see in the jealous, as Mustafa becomes more involved in the scholarly community, moving up in that world, she cannot come with him. The very qualities that make him love her are also the qualities that make her an embarrassment in these scholarly worlds. So you know Zaytuna just does not have any good social graces, let alone the clothing to enter into that world uh, with him. And this alienates the two. In some of the ethical work he's doing for me over the two books, we get to see how Mustafa's sweet naivete can be taken advantage of when he's in the presence of superior scholars and has a hard time thinking for himself. I mean, he's simply not well educated enough yet uh, to know his own mind. And he also really just sort of hasn't found his backbone as a person. In The Jealous, we find him struggling between his conscience cultivated among the strong women of the Sufi community and this legal and social norms that do not bode particularly well for women free and enslaved. He's a stand-in for those lovely Muslim men out there who are tender and kind, utterly sincere, who love their sisters in Islam, but end up taking on positions that harm women because of the structures of tradition that are presented to them as historically incontrovertible, when in fact these things were and continue to be in conversation. And so Zaytuna is there to remind him of his conscience and the dangers of the world he's entering into. And that's really a question I wanted to bring up in the book in an ethical sense, because I say these books really are about they're, they're historical, but they're also, too, about how we remember our Muslim past and what that means for us. And so he sort of plays this role of a, of a person who, who reminds us of what, it, of what it is to remember the past and to take certain positions over others when we have, when we have other options, to sort of think that, to think that question through. Uh, and of course, you know, Zaytun is always going to be the one to tell him, to tell him the truth when need be. And here, too, if I can break in, I want to thank you for your wonderful suggestion of a scene in which a guard corners Mustafa and demands a legal dispensation from him, and he is utterly overwhelmed. Uh, he's trying to balance his two worlds, Sufi and Hadith, as well as just simply trying to figure out what the right thing to do is for this person in this situation. And, and I really, you know, it was, it was a great suggestion because it really just allowed me in that one scene uh, to show the, you know, the, the message that he was in and sort of give us a sense of, of the of the problem for him actually doing a lot more but I think that's enough for right now the city of medieval Baghdad itself can also feel like a character in your novels your details on clothes food and domestic matters are sumptuous what works did you consult for your writing and what decisions did you have to make to, to compromise historical details for literary advancement Thank you so much. I mean, the word sumptuous just makes me ridiculously happy, you know, to, to talk about, you know, my descriptions of Baghdad that way. Um, you know, a, as you know, the buildings, roads, canals of Baghdad of that day are gone. Um, and so sorting out what the city looked like was very difficult. The scholarship on it is not entirely clear. I went uh, with Austin Ahola's maps and crisis and continuity at the Abbasid court, but also using uh, Lassner and Lestrange uh, where needed because they give a lot of sort of street level details um, as well as any other details I could glean from any other sources. But the details, figuring out what Teen and Zaytuna would have seen in a walk across the city were really 
a lot of work. There's this one scene in The Lover, uh, which readers really seem to enjoy, where Teen and Zaytuna go from one side of the city to the other. And, and just this one scene, which is like, I don't know, maybe five paragraphs took two full weeks to research. It was a lot of work, but really satisfying to me as a writer. Uh, so your wonderful compliment that the city feels like a character in the novels is, is deeply gratifying to me. Thank you. Now, El Jahez's Book of Misers uh, was a huge source for me, as is uh, Ahsan's book on the social world of the Abbasids. So there were other resources for me, like Judith Ahola's dissertation on Tariq Baghdad, in which she details the various kinds of work that Hadith scholars undertook to pay for their livelihoods, since teaching gigs were not at all guaranteed, kind of like today. Uh, but Mustafa became a potter because of her. So, you know, these books that I used and, and many others gave these lovely details. And, and you know, I think the, the best example is reading, uh, you know, El Jehez's Misers when he jokes about a man who's too cheap to provide rags for bum wiping or a worker to clean out the latrine catchment regularly enough. So now with that story, I know now how people wiped their bombs and what they did with the effluvia. So the well-off had indoor latrines and the results of which would go out sluices to a catchment area where a worker would be paid to remove it. And I know from other sources that these cleaners would then dry it into dung patties and sell it for fuel. And from other sources that human dung was the cheapest fuel and typically used by the poorest of the poor. The details are gleaned from so many sources, but also importantly from colleagues who were kind enough to share their expertise with me. So, uh, you know, just one example, Mathieu Tillier, whose work guided my account of the religious courts and the jealous, and I'll get back to that in a moment, shared with me manuscript images of judges, their clothing, the backrests they leaned on, uh, how the courts were set up. Now, I read everything he wrote, but there were still gaps, and he kindly filled them for me when I reached out to him. There's a, there's a really great Sogdian historical reenactment group called Iran Ud Tehran, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And they did, you know, when I reached out to them, they helped me make sure I was getting Turkmen clothes right. And they're on Twitter. And also I want to put an advertisement out for them. They have a Patreon and uh, it's, it's just fascinating to follow them. Uh, their work is really interesting, but they were a big help. You know, so, so it wasn't just books, but it was also people and the enormous generosity of, of people uh, who helped me understand their own academic work, uh, as well as people who just, you know, share their knowledge with me. But you mentioned compromises, right? So the compromises were small and large. So obviously there's no grave crime section in the Baghdad police. But I do get the thuggery of the police's reputation, right? As well as their low pay, having informants on the payroll and that sort of thing. Kennedy was a big source for me here, but also Christian Lang. And all these sources uh, with links, if people are interested, are on my website. Now, Tillier confirmed for me after I searched and searched and found very little that we did not know much about the police chief's court. So I had some freedom there. So some of the compromises, they're, they're not compromises, I'm just, I'm filling in gaps, but I'm filling in gaps based on, uh, I'm not just making it up, right? These are, these are educated, these are educated imaginal choices, uh, imaginative choices I'm making because of what, of, of all the other things that I know. But I faced a real problem with the religious courts. So now religious courts at the time were set up to take cases very quickly. A judge would see perhaps 50 cases a day in such a way that the courtroom drama that I needed for my story was highly unlikely. So I still tried to make it a bit more dramatic uh, than was historically possible in the draft that I sent to Tillier, and he wisely urged me not to mess with history on that count. Uh, so what I ended up doing, uh, you know, with his approval, I wanted to make sure he was okay with it, although I think he was a bit sort of scandalized by how far I moved from history in this point, so I don't blame him for anything that I did. But, but uh, I ultimately made my judge say how much he longed for the days of the Umayyad courts when they were investigators in their own right asking questions of witnesses to determine the facts of the case of the people. Sorry, you know, witnesses is even a technical term back in the day. So I don't even want to say witnesses who came before the court, but the people who came before him to determine the facts of the case. So this judge 
right, who's who's longing for this past. He he sort of fancies himself an Umayyad era judge, and so he's he's ready and willing to take on this dramatic case and leave the norms of his day. Uh, you know, and and so I think you know doing it this way, I end up getting this really uh, dramatic court scene that I need, and I think it ended up being a very strong set of chapters. So so that's actually a huge a huge change, and it's actually a real anachronism, right? Because it was not specific to that period, but it's also still sort of historically sound in its in its own way. So it's a big compromise, but also historically sound. But uh, wherever I have to make significant moves away from the historical record, I always point them out on the website. I want total transparency for those who are interested in the in the history of the books. Although I'm surprised, you know, I mean, a lot of people aren't that interested in the history of the books. Really, they're really mainly interested in the story. I can see what pages get the most looks on my website. And the historical sources pages get very, very, very few visits. So, so people really are sort of, you know, are, are really just there for the, for the story to tell. But for those, you know, four or five of us out there who really want to know, it's, it's all on those pages. The British historian George Macaulay Trevelyan said, the appeal of history is in the last analysis poetic, but the poetry of history does not consist of imagination roaming at large but the imagination pursuing the fact and fastening upon it. Dr. Silvers, what is the role of imagination in the study and teaching of history? Well, that is an absolutely perfect quote. I didn't know that. I'd never heard that. So, you know, I think that imagination is such a key aspect of academic work, of historical work. I agree with that entirely. So you must put the people of the past in their place to grasp what the words mean. Otherwise, you know, the tendency is to read, for instance, statements metaphorically when that would not be appropriate. For instance, I was in a grad course in which we were reading an account of a Sufi banging his arm against a wall to protest that he was not attached to this world. The students read it as an act of ascetic self-harm. But I had just been reading Stillman's book on clothing from this period, and I knew that their pockets were in their sleeves. So he was instead demonstrating that he carried no money with him. So we need social details to interpret history correctly. And this requires imagining them as people you could recognize, not mysterious ancients. And that's fastening oneself to the facts, I think. If you think of people as people, in some ways, like you and me, imagining them in their world, they get up in the morning, they fight with their spouse, they make up, the child has a tantrum. If you imagine this, it's easier to see the worldly details in the sources and choose a more mundane and often more correct reading. To make this point more clear, there are accounts of women, some Black, who wandered in rough woolen garments with the words not for buying or selling, meaning not for sale, on them. So now I had only heard metaphorical readings of this, again, about a lack of attachment to this world. But when we know from historical accounts that vulnerable people could sometimes be abducted and sold into slavery off the road, their declarations become more clear. When we consider too that some of these women may have been freed slaves, then the texture of the accounts gain depth and one can more acutely imagine what it would have been like for a woman to wander across the empire back in the day. It's, most histor it's more historically accurate and a more deeply textured account of human experience. So why go immediately to the metaphorical and fantastic? Why not think of a more grounded in the world reason first? And you have to imagine the world to do that. Strangely, thinking more plainly requires more imagination than thinking metaphorically. I wonder if sometimes we rush to the metaphorical to avoid imagining the mundane, because the mundane can make us so uncomfortable. We love the patina of age to avoid seeing the muck, but also the particular beauty of the past. So you know how Greek statues were painted in a way that we might consider gaudy now, right? All that clean marble was not how they liked the thing. What we want for them is not what they wanted for themselves. So you have to imagine the Greeks as fully complex human beings to not shove them into a rather unimaginative box of ancients of wisdom with clean marble statues. 
So, you know, in any case, you know, I had from my first published article relied on imagining the worlds of people about whom I was reading, rooted in social history, and drew my interpretations that way. So, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but novel writing was not far off. You know, and I've been so pleased by the response from regular readers, but also professors and their students. So the books are bringing the time and place, and more importantly, the people and ideas to life. Uh, one professor whose class I just visited to talk about the book said that she thought the history that they were learning in The Lover might be the only reading that the students will carry with them because it so captured their imagination. Uh, you know, it's important, I think, in, in teaching that we that we feed that aspect of students' historical knowledge uh, rather than just sticking to to you know to dry works, which have their place. But imagination is is really what captivates and brings these these worlds to life. But more importantly, what I keep hearing from professors as well is how the books seem to humanize Muslims for non-Muslim students, representing them in all the diversity and emotional complexity and depth that these particular students are frankly unused to imagining for this for these people. You know, and I taught undergrads too, so I know how this goes. And I'm just incredibly great, grateful that that I can contribute still teaching in my own way through these stories. Finally, Listeners can find more on your work at your website, llsilvers.com. Recommend further readings and tell us any current projects and forthcoming works and an extract for our listeners. So the, the, the extract, of the, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to read a bit from the book. And the extract I want to read is actually the scene that you inspired for me. So, so let's, let's get started that. So it's, it's starring Mustafa. And he's going to the round city because he has to go see Teen and Amar in the morning to talk to them about the case. Uh, so he's done the morning prayer at the great mosque in the round city. So after, so here we get, let's get going. After the prayer, he walked with the throngs of men in a hurry to get out of the mosque. He held his new robe close against himself to protect it from catching on the metal of scabbards he saw in the men here and there. A man who had left the mosque ahead of him went into one of the police offices. A guard stood before the door. The guard's robe was stained and too thin for the cold of the morning. He was obviously wearing every bit of clothes he had in layers and only a scrap of black cloth on his head for a turban. Mustafa felt the warmth of his own robe and the firmness of the well-round cloth of his scholar's turban on his head. He said a prayer for the man, then greeted him. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here to see Amar et Tabani of the grave crime section. The guard looked at his turban and didn't even ask his name. Wa alaikum assalam, imam. He's the one who just walked in ahead of you. That office down there, four doors. The guard paused. Hold on, I'll walk with you there. The guard sounded embarrassed. I would have been at prayer too, but I, I can't leave my post. I'll make it up later. He paused again, then asked, Imam, do you think that's a sin? Mustafa bought some time by repeating his question. Missing the prayer because you have to be at your post? They will not excuse you to pray? The guard said, no, I've asked. They will not permit me. Mustafa was unused to this, despite it happening to him more and more. He'd counseled in his own neighborhood but he knew those people, and they knew him. They most often came with the right. For, uh, they most often came to the right answer together. But now that he could afford the clothes that made him look the part, he often found himself in situations like this, with nothing to say, or he feared the wrong thing. In his distress over the morning and surprise at the question, he could not remember how Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal would respond. It was not an excusable illness, but it was not out of laziness. And it was not his choice. Grasping, he said, he hoped, in a tone that conveyed assurance, the Prophet ﷺ said, works are with their intentions. He thought for a second and then added, you only need to look into your heart to know. The man stopped before the door and faced Mustafa. My heart? Mustafa wished he had not said the second part. The man just wanted simple guidance. He wasn't a scholar of the law, but these questions, they were answered by Hadith scholars in the past. He was barely a Hadith scholar himself, but these kinds of questions were answered by the aunts and uncles of the Sufi community. One does not need to be a legal scholar, he thought, to share the wisdom of the prophet with the people on matters such as these. It's not as if this is a marriage contract or a detailed point on ritual law. He stopped himself. 
Perhaps it is a detailed point on ritual law? He didn't know what to say, then thought of his uncle Abu Qasim al-Junaid. He was a legal scholar himself, but he would say that these questions were not about the law, they were about people's relationship with God, and the people need to be put at ease and pushed gently to do better, to become better human beings. Mustafa spoke again, more confidently now. The Prophet salam, said, consult your heart, that what is right puts your soul at ease and makes the heart tranquil. Wrongdoing is when your soul wavers and your breast is uneasy, even if people have repeatedly given a legal opinion in favor of it. Oh, the guard said, his head down, then I am sinning. My heart is not easy. Mustafa closed his eyes for a moment in frustration. Why is this so hard, he thought. He took a breath. I meant that the Prophet salam, wanted us to cultivate a beautiful character within us so that we can rely on our heart's compass rather than having to go to scholars for every little thing. May God reward you, the guard nodded. But by the look in his eyes and how he sounded, Mustafa knew it wasn't the answer he wanted. Mustafa gave up. You did not sin, but you must ask again if you can be relieved to pray. The man smiled then, relief washing the worry from his face, and opened the door for him, indicating for Mustafa to fall back so that he could be introduced. Thank you. Thank you for letting me read that. And thank you for inspiring it. Dr. Silvers, thank you for being our guest. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely.